Um, and uh, it gives me um, considerable pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Val Turner. Um, Val um, has been a regional archaeologist in, in Shetland since 1986, and in fact was the first person to, to hold that, and indeed the, that, that post, and indeed the only person to hold that post since then. <laughs> so um, uh, very much embedded in the archaeology of Shetland, where most of her work has been done, most of her research has been done, and her PhD and so on. Um, and she's worked particularly on looking at, um, at Shetland's prehistoric landscapes, um, also having project managed uh, major excavations, um, for example, at Old Skatnesbroch um, and, uh, and, and Iron Age Village and in Viking Unst as well. So this is um, a, a, a good range of, of, of different sites, but uh, most importantly, I would say, is the um, current work where she's uh, seeking uh, world heritage status um, for, uh, Scot for Shetland's Iron Age monuments, some of which are truly fantastic, including Musa, Old Skatness and Yalsov, of course. Um, it's, um, today, she's going to talk about the um, Pictish elements of Shetland, um, and she's called it um, Hidden in Plain Sight, Pictish Shetland. Um, and I very much look forward to hearing uh, what you have to say, Val, um, as I'm sure everyone else is. Um, so I will hand over to you and uh, welcome and thanks. Thank you, Cole. Right, now to share screen bit. Well, technically, I'm not a picture scholar. So I was delighted to be asked to speak at this conference in honour of Anna, who I encountered soon after I was appointed as the regional archaeologist for Shetland. In fact, Anna's husband, Graham, was involved in setting up the post and appointing me, although I'm not sure that he really expected me to hog the best job in the British archaeology for the next 35 years. But as you will hopefully see by the end of this paper, the invitation to speak about pictures Shetland is very timely. I also realised that so far, everyone else has referred to the Pictish period as early medieval. In Shetland, we very definitely see it as the late Iron Age. So that's just to clarify that because I will refer to it as late Iron Age. When I first arrived, I quickly became acquainted with two widely held myths. Firstly, Brochs and Musa in particular, were built by the Picts, Musa being widely known as the Pictish Broch. Secondly, that most prehistoric remains, particularly house sites and souterrains, were Pects houses. In fact, the, the fact that the sites were often partially buried under vegetation supported the popular view that the Picts were small people who lived underground. Indeed, the Picts and the Trowels, the Shetland Trolls, tend to merge in the Shetlandic imagination. The Trowels also live underground and are frequently considered to be the present day occupants of archaeological sites. From 1958 and the discovery of the St Ninian's Isle treasure, it was clear that there'd been a significant Pictish presence in Shetland. Since then, Shetland's corpus of Pictish art has gradually grown. Initially, much of it was associated with early Christian sites such as Papal in Borough and St Ninian's Isle. But the body of earlier Pictish art has also increased, and it's become increasingly clear that rather than being late to join the Pictish world, Shetland was under Pictish influence at a relatively early date. However, the question of where the Picts lived has been more difficult to answer. There are a clutch of Norse place names, Pettigarth Field, Papa Water and Petterdale, for example, deriving from the Norse word Petter. But were these the last toeholds of the Picts, an ousted society, as Brian Smith, our archivist, has suggested? Well, to look south to Orkney, and as others have already referenced, Anna's sites at Buckhoy on the Bay of Bursay. Although the site was truncated by the cliff edge, there was a sequence of structures dating from the 7th to the 10th centuries. The earliest surviving building, six, had a rounded central chamber with a half 
and two linear, two rectilinear cells opening off it. The walls only had inner faces made with upright slabs and with horizontal courses of thin stones. It seemed that the outer walling must have been created by turf. A second small building, five, was trefoil shaped with three cells surrounding a central hearth and an entrance on the fourth side. The only sign of an outer face there was on the north side, infilled with turf or earth. The third building was the somewhat larger house four at the bottom of the second plan. As you can see, it had four interconnecting rooms in a more linear arrangement. The circular chamber at the northwest end of the building was semi-subterranean, the floor being dug into the natural boulder clay. Inside, there were upright slabs, which Anna related to the upright slabs of the inner face of the piers of the Arlsoff wheelhouses. Although Anna rightly pointed out that the building with horizontal masonry and upright slabs is not confined to the pictures period, her conclusions included the sentence, the distinctive plan forms of the houses, especially house four, should help in the future identification of Pictish settlements. Hold that thought as we return to Shetland. It was Jarlshof which gave Shetland its first identifiable Pictish buildings and in some style. What Hamilton called wheelhouses was somewhat different and later to sites since called wheelhouses in the Western Isles. The four Jarlshof wheelhouses were freestanding clustered around the broch, and indeed one was inside the partially dismantled broch tower. Hamilton argued for their introduction in the second or third centuries AD, although he saw them as having a long chronology. There were four other broadly contemporary buildings at Jarlshof. Hamilton described two as passage houses, ringed in orange in the plan, and two as huts, in the green ring. The better preserved passage house is linked to one of the wheelhouses through a low door, but its main access was via a long sloping passage. Both house and passage were vetted into an earth bank. The huts on the western periphery of the site and missed by most visitors were built into slight hollow scoops out of windblown sand. The northern hut was abandoned before the southern one was built. Hamilton then went on to excavate at Clickermin. Unfortunately, not appreciating that had been, there had been considerable antiquarian, dis, antiquarian disturbance there. At Clickermin, the only extant example of a wheelhouse was inside the broch, but Hamilton identified four roughly circular huts revetted into earlier midden heaps as well as a so-called Bronze Age house, all now thought to have been Pictish. A third major Broch excavation took place in 1988-9 at Upper Scalloway. Sharples identified nine structures in the post-Broch Iron Age. The best surviving House 1 was a cellular building, connected by passages to a subsidiary chamber. It was one of seven fragmentary buildings dated to between 500 and 650 AD. Two later structures date to post 650. Sherpel suggested that one of those was a figure of eight building, although only one side survived. There were no wheelhouses within the excavated area, although I believe that I saw one on my first visit to the site before we were even aware of there being a broch there but it was rapidly removed by the builders who were putting in the foundations of modern buildings. On the right hand side of the slide, you can see a further five structures revealed in 2020 by Sam Williamson, who led a human remains call off contract. Although four cells were truncated by the modern development and were minimally investigated due to the nature of the contract, they were better preserved than the previously discovered remains. One structure was a neatly built cell with a deliberately blocked entrance corridors 
and multiple occupation layers. Another is potentially part of a truncated figure of eight building. The quality of some of the indisputably pictish finds belied the quality of the remains. The artifacts included worked bone points and comb fragments, gaming pieces, spindle whorls and painted pebbles, three of which were found in the floor levels of the picture cell. All of the Scalloway buildings are semi-subterranean, with walls created by internal revetments, either into earlier deposits or into the ground. They're small and irregularly shaped. The walls themselves are a mixture of small vertical uprights, which form the base course or arcs of small horizontal slabs. The fourth major Broch and Iron Age settlement excavation was of course Old Skatnes. The site director, Steve Dockrell says, the Pictish phase of settlement of the site provides an architectural record which is unique in the Northern Isles. At Skatnes, some of the earlier large middle Iron Age roundhouses included triangular piers later on. That was to become a feature of the later Pictish modifications to structure 11, which also had a small cell 20 added, and of the later wheelhouse, structure six. At late Iron Age Skatnes, there's a clear shift away from the large roundhouses to smaller buildings with reduced living space and cells. These buildings were generally constructed from smaller stones and were sometimes at least partially dug into earlier infield ruins, midden or rubble. They include both single and double faced walls and the foundation course includes both upright orthostats and horizontal stones. Structure five is a figure of eight building. The largest cell of structure five was only three meters in diameter, was entered through a smaller cell and has an even smaller subrectangular cell at the opposite end. Anna suggested that the small cell at the end of the house at Buckwoy, the closest parallel site, might have been an oracle or a shrine. She also suggests that the side of the structure could have been benches, and that's possible here. Structure seven is built in the middle of the broch and is different again. It included cells and linking rooms with parallels in the remodeling of the broch at Berry in Lewis and also outside the broch of Gurness in Orkney. Although in many ways, these three forms, which date to between the mid sixth century and the ninth century are quite different to one another, they all sit within its distinctive group of buildings all are cellular and all could potentially be corbelled. In 2000, excavations on the eroding shore facing the Broch of Burland in Trondra revealed a series of structures. The earliest stone built structure, two on the left, was sub rectangular with a cell at one end and an internal face of upright stones. It was used for metalworking during part of its life. The excavators, Moore and Wilson, drew the parallels with both Buckwoy and the cellular structure at Skatnes. A later arc of stone at the coast edge, structure three, and two segments of a possibly oval structure were both built with the distinctive orthostats and revetted masonry here dug into rubbly deposits. Another coastally eroding site was investigated at Bayan in North Yale. Settlement there started with a timber building in the Bronze Age and continued to around 400 BC, AD, BC, no, AD, <laughs> sorry. At the last two buildings in the sequence are described as figure of eight structures. The latest and best preserved of these, which is structure two, there are two chambers linked by a short passage, though the whole building was only seven meters overall. The wall, was part freestanding, part revetted, the inside being faced sli slightly sunken into an earlier building. Two other seemingly standalone, potentially Pictish buildings have come to light in the past 30 years. In 1988, 
a silage pit was dug into a mound at Ward Hill or Robin's Bray in Shetland South Mainland. Beverly Smith recorded three vertical sections which resulted and noted a lintel entrance, three masonry pillars and one orthostat which she interpreted as a wheelhouse. She retrieved about a kilogram of late Iron Age pottery from the disturbance and the surrounding midden. In 1994, a year prior to the excavation starting at Skatnes, I excavated a small section of a disturbed and eroding coastline at Gunksty, Noss. In one corner, the roughly buried post-medieval skeletons overlay a small subcircular cell built from stones on edge with traces of an internal and external face, but no surviving wall core. The structure wasn't bottomed due to time constraints and the focus on the skeletons, but finds from the small area which we opened included a corner post from a shrine and a broken rune stone. A portable cross slab incised with an equal armed cross was found close by and was dated to the seventh or eighth centuries by Ian Fisher. We initially interpreted this structure as the round tower for a chapel, the rest having fallen into the sea, we suggested. However, having seen the picture cellular buildings as they emerged at Skatnes, it's very possible that this structure also belongs with the corpus of picture sites. Last year, Steve Jennings carried out a remarkable piece of systematic survey in North Row. Some of the area had been investigated in the early 1900s by Robert Munro and John Abercrombie with, and I quote, the help of some sturdy Shetlanders. However, most of these were not subsequently found by the Ordnance Survey investigators. Jennings identified five picture sites, four being located along a line of connected burns and lochs. The largest complex, the scheduled Giant's Garden, includes at least 20 semi-subterranean structures or cells built from red granite boulders and connected by low lintel passages. Some were partially excavated in 1902. The cells are characteristically small, the largest being three meters by 4.5 meters, and some less than two meters maximum diameter. At least two of the cells survive sufficiently well to include traces of corbelling. The enclosure is the most obvious feature on the site, but it appears to be built over some of the cells, and of course, therefore later. The architecture of the cells is consistent with the Skatnes cellular buildings. Some are single skinned, whilst others are fully or partially freestanding. During a spell of particularly dry weather, Jennings observed a mound in the centre of the site, which is outlined in the bottom right image and visible in the photo above it. It's bigger than the surrounding cells and its excavation could shed light on this intriguing complex. The site on the burn of rural water was described by Munro and Abercrombie as connected together by drain-like passages so small that if they were intended to give access to human beings, it would tax the ingenuity of most men of the present day to wiggle through. Jennings has recorded at least 12 semi-subterranean cells here. The site is built into the hill slope, resulting again in a mixture of double-faced walls and single revetting skins, depending on the surrounding ground. On the lock of raw water itself, there's a complex of cells arranged around the largest, labelled F on Monroe and Abercrombie's plan. Four lintel passages radiate from it. The plan shows what they excavated, but Jennings identified further semi-subterranean cells separated by low lintel passages. The site is largely single skinned, the northern half being built into the hill slope. Again, the passages between the cells are low and narrow, some as low as 0.62 metres and less than half a metre wide. The fourth site in this necklace along the burns at, 
is at Burka Water. Reported in 1967 as stonework under a rock face, Jennings recorded an array of semi-subterranean structures here. He records that it consists of a mix of cells and structures large and small and extends over an area of about 60 metres by 20 metres. There's a central still corbelled or roofed cell measuring about three metres by five metres with a lintelled passage leading to a series of seven single skinned corbelled cells to the northeast. And there's another group of cells about 16 metres further east, which are also partially corbelled, semi-subterranean and single skinned with intact, low, lintelled, narrow passages between them. Jennings' fifth site, Grutness, is located at the seaward end of Petterdale Burn and is somewhat different to the others. The primary structure, one, appears to be a wheelhouse with V-shaped piers dividing the space into four recesses around a central area. The wall survives to a metre high, is double skinned and has a rubble core. But structure two adjoins the first and has three recesses. There are several further cells to the south of these. And like the Grutness wheelhouse, the walls of the other structures contain a base course of substantial boulders. Grutness is therefore a wheelhouse and cellular building complex, not unlike that found at Scatness. Taking this area as a whole, although Grutness and raw water have access to workable soils, the fell field makes this a curious area for settlement. This, together with the sizes of the cells, certainly raises questions as to the purpose of the buildings. Are they representative of settlement at the time, surviving well due to their peculiar location, or are they places of retreat? Or perhaps they may prove to be something entirely different. In 2016 and 17, Claire Christie's excavations at Tronny Shun on the west side of Shetland revised the picture again. Christie excavated a house which archaeologists in Shetland would typically interpret as prehistoric, i.e. Neolithic or Bronze Age. Given that they're so numerous, there have been surprisingly few excavations of such houses, and fewer still have good dating evidence. One of the two houses which Christie investigated yielded surprising results. As expected, the house was constructed in earlier prehistory, but later, an inner skin of large facing stones with loose rubble behind was inserted into the building. The thick ash rich floors associated with this phase contained an artifact assemblage which would not have looked out of place in the Pictish buildings at Old Scatness. A hearth associated with these floors returned two mid first millennia dates. And since the dates come from burnt peat, as Christie points out, the date of the hearth could be significantly later. In the light of this, where should we look to find Shetland's Pictish settlement? Place names with the Norse peta or Pict elements would seem to provide a starting point. Although Jennings' site at Grootness is at the end of Petterdale Burn, looking at the other peta sites on the historic environment record, suggests that there aren't many identified sites attributed to any period in the few areas that have PETA names. In 2002, Brian Smith confidently declared PETA, PETA names in Shetland were almost certainly created after Picts had become an exotic memory. An extreme example is the place called Pettigas Field, the hill with the Picts Yard in the island of Walsa. No one has lived there for 3,000 years. But when I visited the Standing Stones of Yoxi just before Christmas, I was struck by what I saw. The records which Calder and Stuart have left us are exemplary, and nowhere is this more apparent than in his plans of Yoxi and the adjacent Beanie House. 
The report makes it clear that the living end at Yoxi was open, joined to a, a forecourt by a passage. Later, Yoxi was remodelled, effectively being divided into two with a thick earth and stone core, faced on both sides with boulders. That had the effect of creating an inner trilobate or cloverleaf end entered along a paved path, which was probably the floor of, passage, of a passage where the, the sides don't survive. Of the finds, Calder tells us that many may be assigned to a time of later use of the building in the Iron Age as fragments of a vessel and other undecorated pottery of that period were found. He thought that the unusual plan put this site in a class by itself, not only in Shetland, but across the British Isles. And he thought that it was a temple. But then again, he didn't know what we know now. Calder's report tells us that the inner end of the Beanie House was scooped out to a depth of three feet and the inner face was revetted with masonry and boulders. The inside of the inner end had at least two phases, and I'm not necessarily arguing for a particularly late date for that. Of more interest is the Beanie House forecourt, in particular, its latest modifications. In this phase, a new entrance passage was created at J, while the passage into the inner chamber was blocked and creating a recess or cell V. A northern cell was created by facing a previous modification with uprights at Z, and a new cell was created to the south at W. Calder conjectured there was another wall to the east of the main cell K, although on the basis of only one boulder. The south side of the main cell was created as an arc of horizontal walling with an inner face, which Calder described as backed by a rubble core and no real outer face. Even the large curved path is in keeping with the Pictish interpretation. Calder says that the finds supported the use of the building up to the early Iron Age, but says that the majority are nondescript. But they do include steatite sherds and a flat steatite spindle whirl, which would not be out of place in the late Iron Age. And so, two potentially Pictish buildings emerge on Pettigarth's field from a very well-known site. Of the two small cairns on the hill above the site, the square chambered cairn on the left fits comfortably into the Shetland class of Neolithic chambered cairns. The smaller kist is different, although given its Pictish hilltop, given its hilltop location, it may not be Pictish. This has led me to look back through all the excavation reports of previously excavated house sites in Shetland. The majority are certainly what they claim to be, Neolithic or Bronze Age houses. However, Calder excavated three houses in the vicinity of Stanydale Temple, all three of which had an internal shape resembling the Buckquoy house. However, the Stanydale house contained no finds at all which suggested any Iron Age occupation. The house near Grooting School had paving added, the west end of which expanded into a core of stones faced with a single course and created a small oval cell Y. The inner end of the cell is butted onto the end of a pre-existing partition between the main chamber and the inner chamber of the original building but there were no diagnostic datable finds. The Nessa Grooting House clearly underwent a major reorganization and reduction in size when the inner end was infilled and revetted with an inner skin. The floor plan resembles the Neolithic Scored of House, Scored of Blooster House One, but there's also a single later cell on the southeast side close to the door. The cell was created by two slabs on end and walling added to its west side. The entrance passage was also repaved. Calder says that they recovered sherds from 120 pots 
half a dozen of which were Iron Age, and he claimed from a higher level, implying that that was a post-abandonment phase. But no Iron Age site which they might have come from has ever been discovered nearby. An interpretation of the cell as an Iron Age intervention might be a better fit. Meanwhile, a spindle whirl was retrieved from the floor. Calder thought it had been dislodged from higher up in the site and wasn't in its original context, but its very presence raises questions. In 1967, Peter Moore reported a large green mound at Wester Hyogaland in Unst, which he described as having circular indentations in the top. He found rough stone implements and burnt stones as well. And he suggested that the site was possibly Iron Age. The Ordnance Survey visited two years later and concluded that there is obviously an artificial structure here, but it's impossible to determine its nature. The aerial view suggests that it's a strong candidate for a Pictish site. Amongst a, rem a remarkably well-preserved collection of prehistoric monuments at Sandwick Walsa, there's a mound which has been described as a trefoil house. In contrast to the other remains, this has been somewhat dismissed as, and I quote, far too fragmentary to be surveyed. However, an alternative interpretation is that these remains are a well-preserved cellular complex. And the third site here worth considering is the large mound in the heart of the extensive prehistoric remains at Pinhuland. There are at least eight other houses in the complex, all of which are roughly circular and which fit comfortably into an early prehistoric picture. But the largest mound is far more complex. When I did my PhD, I assumed that it was um, an extensively remodeled pre early prehistoric house. When Dietliff Mahler looked at it, he saw it as multiple houses. But actually, the interpretation of the site as a collection of cells sits far more comfortably with the remains. These three sites must only be the top of the iceberg. All too often, we don't see what we're not looking for. Inevitably, more excavation is needed to test these suggestions, but perhaps the next place to look for more sites are the areas which have produced Pictish art, whether secular or ecclesiastical. However, a word of caution does need to be sounded. There are two outliers to the growing collection of picture cellular buildings in Shetland. Three Iron Age buildings were excavated at Kebister, all with radiocarbon dates falling between 550 BC and 150 BC, 150 AD, taken from carbonized grain. The last of these, Structure 5, was this multicellular building built into a single scoop with walls of large subangular boulders and crude coursing, although it wasn't semi-subterranean. The pottery from the linked cells included broch type pottery and decorated wheelhouse type pottery, which Owen thought might have come from a later vanished Iron Age building nearby. At the coastally eroding site of Millerskera in Unst, the latest building on the site was constructed in the second or early first century BC. It had an inner wall made from large upright stones built into and revetting the glacial till. Assuming that the dates for both these sites are correct, they serve as a warning that Pictish buildings are the flowering of a Shetland building tradition, which has very long roots. In any event, I hope that I've demonstrated there are, there are likely to be far more Pictish buildings in Shetland than we've hitherto realized, some of which at least will still be hidden in plain sight. And I have to end with my thanks to Claire, to Sam, to Steve, 
all of whom have been incredibly generous in sharing their research and their images with me. And also to Noel for reading an earlier draft of this talk and assuring me that I wasn't completely mad. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Val. Very, very interesting. Um, it's good to see those landscapes and the different types of buildings that you um, have enunciated uh, for us. Um, I was quite struck as I was looking at it that you know that there are lots of different types of uh, wall construction represented, and it reminded me very much of um, the the sites at Bakoy um, and the um, excavation of the Pictish house uh, by Morris on, on the Brock Road. Um, the the wall, wall construction is completely different, but you still class them both as cellular structures because they, they are in footprint. So um, it, it's quite an interesting um, uh, avenue of exploration, I would say. Um, I've got lots of other things, but I'm going, I'll email you about those because there are, uh, there are other uh, questions coming in, which uh, is more important to deal with. Um, so um, from Sue Hampstead, she says that she noticed that the structure at Bayan and, and Yell is in the shape of a double disc. Might this be significant, she says. Well, that's an interesting question. Um, maybe all these cellular structures um, have more relationship to the simple stones than we've even begun to think about. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, question from uh, from Barbara: um, Could the cells with very low narrow passages be storage areas similar to souterrains, or the people living in the wheelhouses and the larger structures? That's from Barbara Thompson. Um, it's not impossible. Um, they are very small, I have to say. Uh, but at Skatnes, um, where they've been excavated in very recently to modern standards and also at Yarlsov. They have domestic assemblages or metalworking assemblages. Um, they don't, and in fact, I think, uh, was it, Bay no, it wasn't, I think it was Burland rather than Bayan. No, not sure about it. No, it was, it was that one at Burland that, that we've talked, just talked about the, um, the double disc one. That one end was, um, had domestic type debris in it and the other end, um didn't other the other end was more tools and so they, they it's like they were two distinct areas although they are tiny it has to be said thank you um a question now from rod mcculloch um hi rod um he says that he, he wonders whether you you would consider the late iron age midden and collapsing brock masonry at east shore as a pointer to a further picture site if so could we see late Iron Age settlement under many of the raised mound settlements in Shetland? I think undoubtedly that's true, Rod, definitely. Um, we, the, it's proven that there is Pictish settlement around the Brochs now. I think that's, that's without a doubt. Um, the slightly less proven thing that I'm interested in pushing a bit further is where the ones are that are not associated with the Brochs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a question from uh, Erica Gillespie. She says, have there been other indications of textile production beyond the spindle worlds, uh, perhaps items that could be identified as loom weights or wool combs? Uh, and if not, are there any thoughts as to what that could, uh, what that could indicate regarding the occupation of these sites? Hmm. Um, at Scatness, certainly there were um, plenty of loom weights, some of which were actually in a later reoccupation of that um, structure 11, the, um, the wheelhouse that was actually partially infilled and then it seems to have become um, a weaving shed. And that was, that was lovely in as much as it seems that the loom was standing there and when they, they cut the loom weights off the bottom and kind of left them in place, ready for the next piece of cloth to go up, which clearly didn't go up. Um, uh, I don't know if you want to speak more about the loom weights, Cole. Um, not especially, not just now. Sorry, um, but I would like to. I would like to uh, to just uh, mention. And, and there don't seem to be any more questions. So I just would like to mention the the whetstone that you showed from. Um, is it Tronishun? Is yeah. that how it's pronounced? Yeah. Um, uh, I, I was quite surprised to hear that being included um, as potentially um, Pictish, and I did wonder if it was in fact. Um, 
uh, Norwegian schist and therefore whether or not it could be Viking. That's Does interesting. That the stratigraphy. <laughs> well, there was nothing else there to, to suggest there was a Viking <laughs> presence there. And, and also it depends how, how you see the relationship between the Vikings and the, and the Picts and whether or not you think it's impossible that there could be Viking things in a Pictish context, which, no, which yeah. Skartness, exactly, and Skartness suggests yeah. Yeah. wasn't the case. Yeah, yeah. I think one of the things that uh, just since you've raised Skatnes again, I think it's it, one of the things that I think is really quite interesting is that, you know, we're um, the, the questions that we raise now about identifying Viking houses or, or, or Scandinavian incoming uh, populations um, are, are ones which are just as germane at this other juncture, at the start of the uh, identifying Pictish um, structures, because you know, we, we've accustomed to thinking of rectangular buildings equals Norse. We now know that that's clearly the wrong question to be asking. We were look, not looking for the right things. And so this is hiding in plain sight, just as in fact you would see, and you're suggesting um, for the Pictish remains as well, um, that, you know, that if you start to look for one thing, then you, you will find more of them, but actually at the risk of not looking for alternatives. Um, and I think that, that, I think it's a really interesting juncture that we're at just now, where we can start to see that, um, the, 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 um, the changes in our views, really, um, uh, with these massive landscape surveys. So I think that's really good. I think you're right. And I think what's underrepresented, vastly underrepresented in Shetland, um, because of the peat, and because they haven't been expected, and um, where would you actually prospect to find them? Other timber yeah. buildings. Yeah. And I'm sure that we've got Pictish and Viking timber buildings that we are just not seeing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yes, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm sure. And it's quite exciting that. Um, there's a question here coming from uh, Linda, and she says, when you talk about the very small passages, how small are they? Um, and would they be accessible to modern people crawling, wriggling along when lying down? Well, um, so w one that Steve measured that I referenced was um, it was 0 0.6 meters high and it was about 0 0.42 or 45 meters wide so you you could get a, you could get along it if you weren't claustrophobic I think yes. well depending <laughs> on your size <laughs> Yes, and your age. Yes. <laughs> um, and then um, a, a question um, uh, again from Rod, uh, Rod McCullough, saying that uh, he's talking about the Yupik dwellings in Alaska, which, uh, which of course are modified for, uh, for, um, for the weather. Basically, they have sunken entrances, long entrance passageways, um, which are winter houses. There are summer houses as well, which I think is, um, he, he's not talked about that but there are summer houses too which are different architecture but the, these uh, long houses with uh, with the long entrance ways are, are designed for the winter um, where it says that the entrance is deepened to keep out the cold so could many of the phases seen in the less substantial architecture of the later iron age reflect similar seasonal rebuilds um, and not longer term phasing answer that without excavation <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think we just have to say pass until until we've excavated some of these sites or re-excavated some of these sites. Yeah, it is quite an interesting question, though, isn't it? The, the, the uh, season, seasonal um, um, accommodations and presumably directions of the passageways, um, not in not for prevailing winds and so on. Um, so I think that that's that's actually um, quite an interesting um, personally and having an interesting avenue. Mm -hmm. um, there are no further questions as far as I can see. Oh, yes. The last one here. Uh, this is coming from Elizabeth. Hello, Elizabeth. Um, Elizabeth Pierce. What do you think should be the priorities for future studies of the Picts in Shetland? That's a very good one to finish on. Prioritize what you what you need to do. I think. Um... Well, I've always wanted to ice skate at Pinhuland anyway, um, and so I would focus and work on there. Although when I have dreamed of, of working at Pinhuland, it hasn't been with a Pictish hat on. Um, now I think it would be great to kind of try and get that relationship as well. And also, well, I th also uh, maybe the Giant's Grave at North Row, which, yeah. um, which I think is so intriguing. And could unlock quite a lot of this or at least probably throw up more questions but would be great to excavate yeah 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 
Well, that was that was great, um, Val. Thank you so much for that, and and really interesting to see um, a completely different landscape where we have um, where you have identified um, a, a Pictish activity. So thank you so much for that.